Within these last 10 years, we've gotten many indie games that have taken off and gotten a very mixed reputation in different ways. Some of them being games like one of my personal favorites, Benny and the Ink Machine, Doki Doki Literature Club, Inscription, Amnesia, Elden Ring, and Poppy Playtime to name a few. And of course, you could forget Five Nights at Freddy's. But out of all of these games, there's been one that was made by one man and to some is viewed as an overrated game when people like me think it's a visual and unique masterpiece with great music. And of course, that is Garnaban- I'm, I'm just kidding, obviously, it's Undertale. It's it's, it's it's Undertale, obviously. Do you really think I was going to talk about Garnaban, man? <laughs> uh, who knows, I, I, I might soon, sooner or later. But for right now, <coughs> Undertale. I don't care what people say. This game is actually perfect. And if you have seen my channel or even my Series 3 RAM analogs, you know I can be very picky with games and videos and make sure to see if there's anything wrong with it. But Undertale, I actually can't find anything bad about it. Also, forgive me if my voice is a little bit dry. I have been, uh, I guess you could say, under the weather for the past few days. I think I like was in the sun for too long because it's like, I think at some moments it was 100 degrees at, over here. Oh, Lou. <coughs> so then I think it <coughs> affected my throat a little bit. So there might be times where, my, where uh, my voice goes out or something. And so if you ever realize that, well, that's the reason. Alright, uh, so anyway, <coughs> back to Undertale. So what makes Undertale an allegorical masterpiece? Well, based on this video you clicked, this should be what you're here for, to compare and contrast its vast viewpoints. Let's look at six small features, in my opinion, of how to make the perfect game. And those six features are visuals, mechanics, music, writing, characters, and interpretation. So let's go ahead and talk about the allegorical beauty of Undertale. First off, the visuals. The visuals are freaking amazing. It's got this 8-bit charm, kind of like those 1980s arcade games like Pac-Man and Dig Dug. But what makes Undertale very unique, even visualized, is the fact that it doesn't keep just one visual style. For example, in the intro, we see of what looks like an 8-bit scene that seems to use just some orange and brown colors, but most of the scene when showing the surface, immediately establishing to the viewers that the surface seems to be this bland place compared to this game we're about to play. But once the human falls into the underground, it immediately gets colorful, showing how this place is a whole new place compared to the surface. Everything is new. Especially the fact that Frisk is basically a child makes this even more believable because if you were a child and discovered this new and crazy place, it would be amazing to the child mind. What also makes the visuals great is the animation sprites might look lifeless at first, but the dialogue boxes, instead of just having the text of what the characters are saying, has both the text and the characters' faces, showing so many facial expressions. And then, there are the fights. When being summoned into a fight, all the characters are in a black, white, and gray template with a little red added in there instead of all the other color that we saw before. It's unknown why this actually happens, but I think it's because in this moment, you only care about the battle. You limit everything else out of your mind and just focus on the enemy in front of you, making it a somewhat bland and limited space, which actually works really well in these type of situations. Even all the locations we visit have a very unique visual atmosphere, like Snowden Town is a peaceful snowy area, and the Hotlands is a lava area. But then, with Waterfall, we not only see how this is a magical, watery area, but even in the distance we see a lonely castle, all alone in this place that isn't really explained, but you know, that's okay. Because we got to interpret what exactly it is. And um, there has been interpretations that it is Asgore's castle, but at the same time, if you look at the landscape, most likely that's not real. Because I think that's what it is, is <clears throat> based on the uh, layout, I'm pretty sure it's like underneath the, uh, underneath Hotlands. I don't know, I had to look up the maps for Undertale in order to figure that out. But that's not what I'm here to figure out. I'm here to talk about how Undertale is such a good game. And then the Judgment Hall. Oh my word, it's so simple just a hallway with pillars, but then seeing Sans judge us as we step forward is so simple and yet so visually appealing. Lighting and all. There's also one other impressive visual decision and I think all of you know what I'm talking about. Photoshop or Omega Flowey. Flowey is an impressive character altogether, which I'll discuss in the character section, 
But this abomination is just gorgeous. This disturbing amalgamation is just made up of a lot of crap put together, like a skull, two extra eyes, plant-like arms, and a TV in the forehead with Flowey's face. And even when you get a part of the way through, one of the souls that Flowey possesses acts out and brings an entirely new attack mechanic you have to dodge, which I'll touch more on of that later. But visually, you will find an act button in the middle of these puzzles, and once you interact with the act button, we change from the black, gray, and white template of very dangerous weapons to dodge, to a green template with a peaceful item, replacing the dangerous one. The only other visual moment I can think of is something towards the end. Before going to the Judgment Hall, we approach a house that looks a lot like Toriel's house from the beginning, but colorless, and we piece together that this is Asgore's house, Toriel's husband, and just shows that he went through something that might have made him give up on life, showing the depressing home, which I'll tell you more about later in the characters and writing sections. And also, the visuals of 3D Barrier and this 2D 8-bit retro world is just a nice sight to look at. And with all of the amazing visuals sections out of the way, let's continue on to our next section. Regarding mechanics, Undertale is one of those games that has multiple mechanics, but doesn't make it too difficult. All the mechanics are found in the fights. Well, some puzzles have different mechanics, but I'm not talking about that right now. However, I must admit, none of the puzzles are too hard to beat, which makes it actually enjoyable. But as far as the fights go, it takes, at least in my opinion, a Pokemon-style battle approach. You can decide to fight, use an item, try sparing them, or act out something. And it depends which route you want to take, but you can either hit the enemy on a gauge with the edges, making them take not too much damage, but hitting the green piece in the middle of the gauge to make some critical damage on your opponent. Or you can try acting and talking with the characters or playing with them until you can spare their lives and leave the battle. Now, it also has a very interesting mechanic when it comes to killing an enemy as well. You can have the chance to level up and get more health in battle, but it only goes up if you kill the enemies. And if you don't, you stay at level 1. Another mechanic that a game has in general is if you kill certain characters, that will help change the route you're going on. But, you know, I'll explain more on that later in the characters and writing sections. Almost every battle is made in a style of RPG fighting, where after you do your move, your soul is contained in a square box you can move around in, and the enemy does a unique attack where you move your heart away from their attacks to avoid taking damage. And you just continue the battle until they kill you, you kill them, or you spare them. But this battle mechanic changes when we get to Papyrus. Papyrus has always been portrayed as a character who wants to be popular and impress everyone around him, but fails because he's being clumsy or he gets too caught up in the moment. So when fighting him, it seems based on his first attack, he doesn't know how to fight. But then at the last minute, he turns your soul blue and hits you, showing that he can use some sort of gravity pull on your soul and can switch between gravitation and free roam evasive mechanics. After Papyrus, we meet Undyne, who has an entirely new mechanic. Just like Papyrus, Undyne switches between two different evasive mechanics. And of course, being the free roam and the other being a green soul, which has a shield attached to it. The purpose of this is Undyne is a warrior and throws arrows at you from all four directions to where you use the shield to block each arrow at the specific time. Oh, and uh, did I mention you can also flee from an enemy? Yeah, you can flee from an enemy and you will never see them again, unless it's Toriel or Undyne. Toriel will wait for you to attack her later, but if you escape from Undyne, she chases you until you get to the hot lands where she becomes a dehydrated fish. Well, I guess it also kind of works with a uh, Papyrus as well, but, you know, just like Toriel, you can't really progress unless you, uh, fight him. Alright, so anyway, the next mechanic is when you fight Muppet. While you're traveling the Hotlands, you get trapped in her webs. And for her first attack, she pours some purple tea into your box. And suddenly, your heart turns purple, and there are three purple spider webs you're balancing on, while Muppet launches a variety of spider-themed attacks at you, and you either have to survive her for a few full minutes, kill her, or eat a spider donut in front of her. And I will tell you right now, on pacifist mode, this boss made me way more mad than it should have. This is the only time this mode appears, however. Then, when we get to the Metaton fight, we are shown that our normal attacks do nothing to him. But Alphys gives you a feature to use on Metaton that transforms your soul into a yellow gun to attack Metaton, which you then use to fight Metaton. Those are all the times your soul is messed with and turns different colors. Well, I mean, there also is, uh, I think her name's Mad Mew or something. 
There's this weird Nintendo Switch option for Undertale, but I don't have a Nintendo Switch, so I don't know how that one actually works. But I know it has a unique purpose. So yeah, those are pretty much all the times your soul is messed with and turns different colors, but each of them serve a unique purpose, and they don't overstay their welcome. However, there are two more mechanics I want to introduce. From Asgore's boss fight, he doesn't change your soul and color or anything, but instead breaks the fifth wall, if there is one, and destroys the mercy button, forcing you to fight him until the mercy button comes back. The last time the mechanics change is in the Omega Flowey boss. We see that now we aren't contained inside of a box, but instead we're free to roam the bottom half of the screen avoiding Flowey's attacks. And even when presenting the Souls minigames, we are not isolated inside of a box, but instead we are put into this extreme situation. Now with mechanics out of the way, Let's move on to the music. I think it's no surprise that the music is what helped make Undertale popular in the first place. And for good reason. When listening to the music in general, it's a bop. But playing the game and finding out exactly where the music is in the game is a whole new thing. It's an entirely new experience. Even starting with the introduction to the game with the soundtrack Once Upon a Time playing, it is a very somber and somewhat sad tone. But once we fall into the underground, not only do the visuals light up, but the music speeds up a bit. Also, the start menu music is just plain cheery. Everyone has to admit that. It's just, it's just cheery. It's nothing else. It's cool. But then, once we meet Flowey, the track Your Best Friend starts to play, where, as we know, Flowey initially starts off as a good tutorial for you on how to play the game, but soon tricks you and all the music just stops. And directly after, Flowey is dealt with, and we meet Toriel with this peaceful yet a bit somber tune, known as Fallen Down, that gives you this instance that there is hope and triumph, even while being stuck down here. Also, just so this video doesn't get too boring or long, I won't be talking about all the music, but the music that helps set up the scenes. For example, I'll not be mentioning a bunch of background music or music that is just a different rendition of another musical piece from the game, if that makes sense. The next musical piece I want to talk about is Ghost Fight, or otherwise known as Napster Blues theme, which starts off somewhat slow, quiet, and very simple, with not many notes or instruments, but escalates into getting very fast-paced and more complicated of a song with more combined beat drops and looped audio making a very funky remix and later is made a little more aggressive when used in the Mad Dummy battle. The next two tracks I want to talk about are Home and Heartache. Home is a track with very soft and relaxing music, kind of like a harp, I think there's actually a harp in it, when stepping inside of Toriel's home, giving you a very calm vibe about this place, but it's followed up with Heartache which is a more retro and 8-bit fight remix that sounds like something you might find in a Pokemon fight, and gives you a very uplifting and determined feeling during Toriel's fight. She is your first boss to fight, and this is a very appropriate song to fit the mood. And then, there's Sans. And not, not the character, I mean, that's literally the name of his theme when you meet him. It's such a simple and a little bit lazy song, and it matches perfectly to Sans' personality. That's all I've got to say about that. And I know there are a bunch more chill songs in Snowden Town, but the last one I want to talk about in this area is Bone Trousel. I know quite a few of you already know about this song. It starts off with a very smooth beat with a drum, some guitars, and maybe a piano, but then halfway through comes out with a violin that just takes over the scene, making it a very swift boss battle for such a comedic character as Papyrus. Okay, but actually I have to mention just one more and that is the Papyrus dating music. Besides becoming a meme, it just has a simple jazz and 80s retro feel that just immerses you. Now, onto the Waterfall area. We have a music track that is cleverly named Waterfall. It gives you this melondine, Minecraft sounding music but progresses into insanity. Because after a while, you start hearing a piano and it just owns a scene. And then a violin and a few other instruments that starts looping, giving you this feeling of dread. That there is something more to this place and someone might be watching you. And upon ending that track, it seems to revert back to its original state as if nothing happened. And the track Danger Mystery, which is a nerve-wracking track, something to fill you with suspicion, a mystery if you will, when you see Undyne in the shadows. Then we have the Undyne music track, aka Undyne's theme in case you didn't know, gives you an electric piano type feel with some upbeat tunes and some ghostly noises showing Undyne in full armor stalking you ready to kill you at any moment. Having this music over, this moment is downright disturbing. <laughs> and even when she is chasing you, the run music track really encapsulates the feeling of being chased down with some drums and electric piano in the background as Undyne tries to kill you. And now, we get to the most emotional music. When doing the statue puzzle and putting an umbrella under the statue will cause this Melondyne track to play. Does it sound familiar? Well, it's because it's used whenever Asriel appears. 
and a few moments with Undyne and Asgore throughout the game. Finally, we move to the Spear of Justice, Undyne's heroic battle theme. At first, it starts out as an almost retro-sounding upbeat tune, then slowly morphs into an 80s arcade game music, transforms into trumpets, and looped instruments goes back to retro, back to trumpets. This whole song kind of sounds like it's underwater, or you finally realize this song in the heat of the fight. Speaking of heat, now we move on to the Hotlands. The Hotlands might look like a creepy place with the scary music in the back, but upon meeting Alphys, the Hotland scientist, her theme immediately shows us what kind of person she is. Insecure, but happy and gentle. Maybe a bit clumsy, with the music track getting off this happy and jumbled vibe. But after meeting Alphys, however, we run into Metaton, which we are told is a human-killing robot, and the ground begins to shake with you expecting some monstrosity of nature, but instead, just a rectangular box with circuits, arms, wheels, and a microphone with a track called It's Showtime playing instantly, showing that Metaton for right now doesn't plan to hurt you, at least not yet, but just wants to run a game show. But upon fighting him later, we hear Metal Crusher, which is a very 80s retro beat with some funky instruments and just downright confusion, which kind of does match Metaton's vibe when we are around him. Okay, so this next one I have has had a bunch of debate about it, and that is another medium. With a techno sounding beat combined with some low whispering and a very quiet choir intervening at different moments throughout as you scour the hotlands, in my opinion it's a bit sad music, but actually it does kind of match the feeling of this place upon seeing it. Well, you know, kind of abandoned, unlike Snowden Town, which I don't think I mentioned it had a very uplifting beat. And really, it, it does, it has a good beat. Throughout the Hotlands, before going to fight Metaton again, you will come across a peculiar and persuasive boss. A spider named Muffet, which I just talked about earlier. And it would make sense for her track to be called Spider Dance, with a very mixed track of unknown instruments with a very low-tuned song, with basically no background noises, but upon hearing the first part twice, the tempo rises giving us a more energetic and enthusiastic feel combined with some whistling and 90s computer noises, giving us the player a false sense of security as if we shouldn't be here right now. I was debating about putting this next one in, but there's a track called Wrong Enemy, which plays on So Sorry's Fight, who's just a clumsy guy who accidentally attacks you. Basically, the track has those 90s internet sounds, and that's about it. Now we get to the handsome Squidward man himself, Metaton EX, which all of us should know what plays, Death by Glamour. We started this song with a few pianos looped over each other, with some of what I believe are trumpets, escalating this song with more unknown instruments, and eventually merges into utter nonsense. We then get of what I can only describe as a rave party DJ who got drunk halfway, and finally, some smooth jazz combined with some drums and more retro, giving us a very classy boss fight with some smooth music. We get to the 71st track, only known as Undertale, which, when traveling through the new home and listening to Adriel's backstory, we get to hear this track, and it's basically just a mix between memory and once upon a time with a slowed down, and it's just a beautiful piece of music. The next track I want to talk about is Asgore's theme, and it starts off as a smooth RPG track, but then speeds up a little bit with a tad bit of delay, and then getting a little bit louder and delayed throughout, with it eventually turning into an 8-bit harmony, and then transforming into an almost demonic track, giving you the sense that this is the end, and speeds up the song a bit to give you that determined feel for this boss. The song then ends with a piano coming in, and the overall beat going quieter, and slowing down, and finally with one more big beat to end the track, before it loops again. Now that Asgore's theme is settled for how good it is, let's go to your best nightmare. That starts off with Flowey's transformation reveal, sounding very mysterious and suspenseful, then to interrupt with his echoing laugh, and cutting back to the first part of the song, but with added drums and textures. Eventually, one of the souls he is possessing will act out and have its own individual song, almost all being either 8-bit, retro, or RPG based, and immediately cuts back afterwards to Flowey's theme, but a tad more demonic and distorted until we get to the finale OST. What is the finale OST, you might be asking? It starts off as a quiet piano for a while, and this place is right as when you're being healed by the souls. And in this moment, you have lowered Flowey's defenses and are free to attack him with a triumphant blend of electric pianos and horns before going full 8-bit for a second and then letting you have everything mixed together, giving you a feeling of hope that Omega Flowey might be big and powerful, but your determination will not let you lose. Some of the last tracks I want to discuss, or at least for the past this route, is Hopes and Dreams and Save the World. 
Hopes and Dreams starts off with a violin melody, but swiftly transitions into electric guitars, drums, bass guitars, and pretty much a mix of instruments to make a triumphant final boss, mostly made up of guitars showing that you aren't alone, that whatever battle you are fighting, this track seems to give you a determined fighting spirit, at least in my eyes, and Save the World is basically just Hopes and Dreams sped up. Now, I know this section is getting a bit too long, but before I close this section about its amazing music, there are three more tracks I must discuss that are only used in the genocide route. Battle Against the True Hero, Small Shock, In My Way, and Megalovania. And now I know I said there's three of them, but Small Shock and In My Way are kind of like blended together, so I'm going to count that as just one. Alright, uh, so when fighting Undyne the genocide route, instead of her normal theme, we hear Battle Against the True Hero, Against Undying the Undying which starts off with a piano but almost immediately speeds up with drums and a faster tempo and an occasional violin. The song then mixes all the instruments together in a variety of ways that makes this music intense until getting slowed down to a sad and somber piano melantine and making the tempo a bit more upbeat, giving hints to her original theme but remaining chaotic and actually kind, kind of depressing actually. The next two are right together and those are Small Shock and In My Way. Small Shock is the music that plays when you meet Asgore, but is slowed down in Genocide and when Flowey tells you about his past, giving a vibe of what I can describe as one music note that occasionally breaks silence, with a silent hum, almost like a small shock, you might say. But then when Flowey gets scared of you later is when In My Way plays, where an almost robotic noise plays with the sound of what I can think of being loud footsteps, giving off this sense of fear of what you or someone else has become, or endured, which is what Flowey is experiencing from you true fear. Alright, here's the last music track I promised, and that's Megalovania. Do I even need to explain this track to you? It's an upbeat tempo that loops itself in a variety of ways, showing you the very definition of defeat, chaos, and determination, all in one. Somehow, because that is what Sans' boss battle is, you are filled with determination, rage, and forced to endure chaos. I feel like you guys might be getting bored of me talking about music. So, let's get on to something more interesting and actually more suited from this channel. The writing. Alright, now just to make this video go faster, and honestly it'll make more sense for me to do this, I am going to be covering both writing and characters at the same time in this section. For the writing of Undertale, I don't think I have to explain why and how writing benefits this game. The writing is some of the best I've actually seen in an indie game. Unlike Five Nights at Freddy's, it does have some complicated story, but it's just complicated to the point where you can still make out a very clear story but there are a few mysteries that are left to the fans to decide. The story pretty much goes that many, many years ago, humans and monsters began fighting, but the humans won and banned the monsters from the surface. Possibly after quite a long time, a new king and queen named Asgore and Toriel are ruling the underground and have a son named Asriel, but to disturb their peace, a human falls into the underground, whom Asriel finds and that is written so wonderfully in this game, where when we see this human fall in the intro, we assume it's us, Frisk. But during the pacifist fight against Azriel, we learned that the human we saw in the intro was Kara, the first human, and was found by Azriel, and the rest we had to piece together in the pacifist and genesis route. But during the journey through the new home in any route besides the genocide route, we are told by some monsters the story of what happened. After Azriel found Kara, she became ill. We don't know why she became ill, but it's assumed that after digesting some of the flowers, or maybe staying down there too long, she became ill. Or she was just a sick person in general. The next day she died, and Azriel absorbed her soul to get through the barrier to get Kara back to the humans. However, the humans misunderstood this and thought Azriel killed her, making them attack Azriel. And Azriel does have the power to kill them, but refuses. Azriel gets severely wounded and makes it back to the underground, to which he finds a bed of golden flowers, and goes over to it, and dies. This you can get him back. You can get him back. Get him! Get that dog over there! Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I just, I'm sorry. Did you get him? Did you get him, baby? My dog's not one that uh, likes other dogs most of the time. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, okay, where was I? Ah, yes. So this made Toriel and Asgore miserable, obviously, and I believe Asgore tried getting their son back, 
somehow through killing another human so he can pass through the barrier, but ends up staying and killing five more, which leads to Toriel divorcing him. Actually, when I said Asgore uh, thought that he could get his son back, maybe he did. He just wanted to get revenge on the humans. That would probably make more sense. Sorry about that. So regarding their relationship, I believe that Toriel and Asgore were a happy couple. And then when they had a kid, they ruled their kingdom together. But upon Asriel's death, they separated. The death of a random human to them is one thing, but the death of your actual child is something entirely different. But where their relationship went wrong was there was good intentions, but two different viewpoints on the situation. Here we see Toriel, who, as we see by her tone and nature throughout the game, she is most likely spending some time grieving and mourning for her son. But Asgore couldn't accept this. He's the king. This shouldn't happen to him. So he remembered Asriel used Kara's soul to escape the barrier. So Asgore waited for another human to fall down so he could escape the barrier to most likely get revenge on humans. But instead of waiting for one human, he collects six human souls instead of one, leading to Toriel finding out and divorcing him. This is what led to their separation, grief and revenge. As for Asriel, it's implied that Alphys was working with Golden Flowers, fueling them with determination, which Asriel conveniently died on. And in the genocide route, we hear the aftermath from Flowey about what happened to Asriel. That he became a flower who, upon finding his mom and dad again, didn't feel love or anything for that matter. Showing us that Asriel became Flowey, but that is obvious after both routes. But upon becoming Flowey, he can't feel any emotions. He doesn't have a soul anymore. So Flowey decides after not being able to feel anything with his parents, Flowey decides to rid himself of this world, so he killed himself. But he respawned. His determination was so powerful that no matter what he did, he would still come back to spawn. Maybe he would help everyone, and then after respawning, he kills everyone. He was curious to know what would happen, but eventually, all good things must come to an end. And Flowey realizes he tried everything. That is until a seventh human came down. That is where we come in. Frisk. Flowey is the first person to meet us in the underground and shows us how to play, but he ends up tricking us, almost killing us. But that is when Toriel comes by to save you, and directly after this is where the story branches off. So she begins to add like the actual tutorial, or I guess to Toriel. <laughs> oh, what have I done? As she takes us through the ruins, we get attacked by a few monsters along the way, and you can choose what to do about them. You can either spare them and be on. <coughs> you can either spare them and be on your way. Leading... You can either spare them. You can either spare them and be on your way, leading to a pacifist route kill them and be on your way leading to a neutral route or kill them and farm around the area for other enemies to spawn leading to a genocide route. Now this is not only where our story branches off but it's also where our perspective branches off. I will save the majority of this for the interpretation feature but overall the writing is very stellar for each route. For the neutral routes you can basically do anything and once you beat Omega Flowey you get a phone call from Sans and whoever is still alive and gives a rundown of all you have done and how the underground benefits from it without it being too outlandish. But then it's the pacifist and genocide routes that gets interesting. When doing the pacifist route, we find many ways to spare the characters, and even the main characters, but each one is different when interacting with you. When confronting Toriel, if you continue to spare her, she realizes she can't keep you here, and hugs you good luck, truly a goat mom moment. And then we meet Papyrus. I mentioned a bit about Papyrus early on, but let's talk about both Papyrus and Sans in this game, in situation. Papyrus has been set up to come across as a diligent, yet arrogant soldier who wants to make a difference. But as we see more situations with him, and the more you get to know him, you realize that deep down he has a soft spot for everyone. If he beats you, he doesn't kill you, but puts you in prison. If we spare him upon beating him, we then go to his house and go on a date with him, with Sans being a bit annoying to him. Even though this is a bit far-fetched, it sets up the ending with the true pacifist route of us dating Papyrus. Speaking of Sans, let's talk about him for a moment. Sans, just by a Snowden theme, is presented as a very laid-back, comedic, and lazy guy who just likes hanging out and chatting with people. But we will see later on in the genocide route that he will be serious when needs to be. We do see, however, when we have dinner with him, he has a very sweet side for people, even humans. And unlike his brother, he actually tries protecting the humans. Why? Because he made a promise with Toriel, as he implies, and that he would protect the humans. And with the situation with grief I mentioned with Toriel, this would make sense. Then we head to Waterfall and are approached by two very unique characters, Monster Kid and Undyne. Monster Kid comes off as a somewhat annoying character, but not to the point where he's detestable. 
He's literally just used as a fanboy to Undyne, and that's really his only character trait. Um, besides hanging out with you a bit. There's also a scene where he's about to fall off a bridge, and you can either help him up, or wait for Undyne to save him. Either way, it changes his view on you. Now we look at Undyne, who is perceived as of what I can describe the most determined soldier of Asgore, who when being approached by a human, decides to try to kill you, and brings your soul to Asgore. But upon doing the pacifist route, you must run away from Undyne to the Hotlands, and upon entering, she passes out. You can give her some water, which will surprise her that a human will save her. Later on, you and the Pyrus will go to Undyne's house to cook with her and become friends with her, leading to us getting closer to yet another character. Also, I want to take a moment to acknowledge Mad Dummy, who is just a dummy who gets revenge on you for reacting a certain way to the dummy from the beginning in the movies. It's hilarious, and it was an amazing offhand character. <laughs> That's all I had to say about that. Now we get to one of the last places in the game, the Hotlands. That is where we meet two of the most diverse and creative characters in the whole game, Alphys and Metaton. Alphys is a representation of pretty much every introvert and yet is a scientific genius who can help you with problems along the way. I personally find Alphys the most relatable. Stuttering, and not sure of herself most of the time, but is pretty smart in certain situations. We learn from the pacifist route that she has a secret lab that has some very deformed things, but she has made some robots in her time as well, one of them being Metaton. Metaton, for a robot, is a very likable character, because just look at his introduction. It starts off with heavy stomps, making it seem like an intimidating robot, but upon viewing him up close, he is just a rectangular box with wheels, who runs a game show and a cooking show innocently, with a huge reputation in the Hotlands. But upon playing his games, he has shown almost instantly that he has an intent to kill you if you mess up. While progressing on our journey, we meet with Muffet, who, okay, you already know who she is, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, basically something I just did not mention about Muffet earlier, though, was that she wants to eat you unless you bought something from their bakery. That's basically it. I have nothing else to say about her now. Upon going to the exit to the Hotlands, we meet back up with Metaton, and we have to turn him on, which transforms him into Handsome Squidward and proceeds to show us his sweet dance moves while the ratings are going up. As we boost up his ratings, we see that he gets a call from someone special, Nabstabluke, who loves Metaton. I think Metaton and Nabstabluke were cousins, if I'm correct. Upon beating Metaton, we now head up to the elevator, leading to the new home that leads to Asgore's castle. And we get this beautiful soundtrack along the way as we explore the new home. We see it's a colorless version of Toriel's home, and we are presented with some monsters telling us the story of what happened to Asriel and Kara without actually telling us. Also, about the new home, something that I realized about the new home is, I think I know the reason why it's colorless, is because Asgore never got past the stage of grief. You think about this, Toriel's home is so colorful and she has moved on. Yes, she still remembers Asriel and keeps it, you know, in her memory and, you know, still acknowledges that he, you know, is her son and everything. But since he's dead, she realizes there's nothing she can do about it. But then with Asgore, Asgore was so reliant on revenge that he never properly grieved for his son, leading to his house being filled with dark memories and just depression. It's actually kind of sad. I was thinking about putting this in interpretation, but I have a whole nother thing to set for interpretation in a little bit. So yeah, I just wanted to put this out there of like what the reason of why it's so colorless in the first place. So anyway, before going to Asgore's castle, we approach the Judgment Hall, where besides a true pacifist route, we will meet Sans, who judges us for our actions. And upon him judging us, he will tell us that what leveling up truly means, what determination is, what XP is, and judges you for everyone you killed, if you did. And even if you killed just Papyrus, Sans tells you that with no remorse that if we have consequences for our action, why did we kill him? It's dark, and um, yeah, that's just like one of the many things Sans can say to you. But anyway, let's get back to the pacifist route. After Sans, we meet Asgore, who shows us the barrier and fights us, but destroys our mercy button, so we're forced to fight him. After fighting him, even if we spare him, Flowey kills him and takes the six souls Asgore had and transforms into a monster. We all get glimpses of what the souls were like, but then we manage to tell the souls to help us. And upon fighting each soul and confronting them, they help heal you while fighting Flowey, while this masterpiece is playing in the background, and the souls manage to defeat him. And now, we are presented to kill Flowey, or spare him. Upon sparing him, we do a few more things to get to the real ending, and we have the real ending where all of our favorite characters come together, but Flowey manages to capture everyone's souls, take their souls, and gets his body back, which is Asriel Dreamor, the demon. 
He has infinite health and defense, but we have to survive. We need to fight. But how do we beat him? Eventually, Azrael freezes us and tries to kill us like that. And if we die, we refuse to die, leading this battle to go on for literally eternity. That is, unless we save our friends. We get our friends' memories back, but Azrael is still here. So what now? There's one last person to save, and that is Azrael himself. Upon saving him, he explains what happened all that time ago and why he did this, and finds out that we are Frisk and not the human that he helped that long ago. And upon hearing this, we forgive him and embrace him. And if you didn't embrace him, well, then what is wrong with you? Upon Azrael being freed, he destroys the barrier, leading all the monsters to leave to the surface. And we can either decide to stay with Toriel or go to our family. Whichever one we choose, it's a happy ending. And before we head to interpretation, let's talk about the genocide route for a moment. Everything seems to go the exact same as the pacifist route, but instead we kill everybody. And this leaves the Sands judging us for everything that we have done, and even asks us, do you think even the worst person can change? And fights us in the genocide route. Besides Undyne fighting us as Undyne the Undying, the only part I really want to talk about is Sans. Sans, as I have said, is a lazy and laid-back person, but in this specific moment, we see Sans is aware of our decisions and resets and realizes that all of his hate, judgment, revenge, and justice in this one scene. His fight is so hard, but that's the point. Was fighting him worth it? And no matter how you play the battle, Sans is right. If you kill him, that just shows your determination. And if you reset, he knows that you have finally realized your wrongs. Upon beating him, you go to Asgore, who doesn't even recognize you as a human anymore, and you kill him with no remorse. But before collecting his soul, Flowey destroys it and tries convincing you not to kill him. But we kill him anyway, and we are face to face with Kara, the first human. And no matter what we do, erase the world or not, they kill us. And we are then reset. And now with writing and characters out of the way, let's get to the last point, which is interpretation. For interpretation, we are going to find out what does it all mean? Or in this case, how is it allegorical? Well, I think Toriel and Asgore's relationship with each other and Asriel is what made everything unfold. After Asriel's death, Asgore didn't grieve, unlike Toriel, and Asgore went into a state of revenge and anger against the human race, so whenever one will fall down, he will kill them. That is until we come down, and our determination is so big that we can basically be raised from the dead at this point. But I think one thing Undertale is used to tell is a journey between life and the afterlife. Us falling down into the underground could represent our journey into birth and life, and Flowey and Toriel are our tutorials, but shows us that there are good and bad influences in the world, and depending on our choices, it puts us on a certain route through life, and when we get to Sands, the Judgment Hall is Judgment Day. Sands judges you if you are worthy between heaven or hell. The pacifist route, he doesn't even appear, but upon beating the game, the surface could be heaven, with everyone being free into the afterlife, and the neutral routes are used for us to determine, do we go to heaven, or the deeper underground, based on our actions? And the genocide route is used as a representation of H.E. double matches, Sans fighting us to keep us from moving on, but eventually realizing that he can't stop us, and upon killing everyone, Kara, basically the devil, greets us to restart the world, or not. Resetting leads to some sort of reincarnation, and not erasing it for a while, we accept our fate. That is my interpretation of what the deeper meaning to Undertale is. Maybe Undertale isn't real, and it's just a cartoon version of life in a nutshell. Oh yeah, and also there's a man named W.D. Gaster, who is just a ghost man who died as Asgore's previous chief scientist before Alphys. I hope you guys liked this video. This took way too long to do. And uh, I hope you liked this. I, I, I was debating a long time of how I was going to make this video. I'm kind of glad that you guys decided this one and not the other thing, because if you don't know, I made a community post asking where I do this, or why Sans is my favorite video game character, and I think this was actually better. But yeah, Undertale is a masterpiece. If you haven't played it, I would recommend buying it. It's cheap, and uh, yeah, there's a lot to do in it. It's, it's a game that's worth playing at least once. And uh, I'm Complex Lou, and I'll see you guys on the other side. Bye-bye.